Well, that certainly is our prayer. So thank you, Mel and Adrian and Nathan, for uh, putting that together. You know, that, that's our prayer and our hope as we uh, celebrate our nation's birthday and remember the cost that so many have paid before us so that we can enjoy what we enjoy here in our country. Well, my name is Andy, and I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us this morning, both in the room and online. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're a part of it. And as we continue, we're going to sing a couple of more songs together, and we're going to hear a really helpful message. It's really a part of a practical series that we began last week called Love Thy Neighbor, and I think you'll find it challenging and thought-provoking as we jump in a little further this morning. Now, if you're watching online, I'd love for you to jump into the chat and be a part of that. Make that an encouraging place. Say good morning. And if you are our guest, click the I'm a guest link because we'd love to say thank you by sending you a free code for a Redbox movie, just a small way that we can say thanks for being a part of the service. And if you are our guest in the room, make sure that you stop by the in the Lake Country tent as you head out uh, because you'll have the chance to grab a free gift there as well. Again, just a small way that we can say thank you for venturing into the room and being a part of this and carving out time in your holiday weekend. I hope that you'll take advantage of that. Well, as we go through uh, the rest of today, I hope that you'll join us uh, both in the room and online and, and make this service an encouraging part. But I'm going to get out of the way, so if you would, stand to your feet as Mel and Adrian lead us.
search the world
Thank you for singing along online and here in the room. And if you're here with us, we'll invite you to grab your seats. As we've gone through this entire season, I think there's a myriad of emotions that have plagued just about all of us. There's the fear and there's the disappointment and the uncertainty. And certainly that's been true for a lot of our parents this week as they're trying to find out what's exactly happening with school and education and what is that gonna play out to look like. And so as we sing a song and we're reminded that nothing is better than you, Jesus, that serves as such a powerful message of hope for all of us. And yet that hope came at a cost because for Jesus to be our hope, he had to leave heaven behind in order to come to earth. And in order for us to continue to spread that message of hope, it costs something. There's an expense to that. And so as we spread the hope of Jesus, we got to think about what does that cost individually as we build relationships and as we spend time with people? And what does it cost as an organization as we carry that message of hope throughout our community, whether we do that through an online stream or whether we do that in the room with accommodations or whether we're doing that out in the parking lot for family ministry environments or putting this, something together digitally that's available online. All of that spreads the message of hope, but all of it has a price. And I'm so grateful for those of you who have stepped in to say, I wanna be a part of spreading that message. Whether you do that online at lakeaconeychurch.org slash give, or whether you do that here in the room as you leave their buckets beside each auditorium exit door. But thank you for being a part of Love in the Lake Country, spreading the message of hope that we have in Jesus. And you know that around here every Sunday, we work really hard to put the most engaging speakers in front of us, whether that's on our stage or from a nearby campus. And this morning we're going to hear from Jamie Dickens. He is the lead pastor of North Point's newest Atlanta area campus in East Cobb. And he's gonna be sharing part two of our series entitled, Love Thy Neighbor. But before we get there, I'd love to take a moment and pray for you. God, thank you that in the middle of everything going on in our world, that you still remind us that you're unchangeable, that you are unwavering, that you're not terrified by anything that's happening. And God, in the moments of disappointment where things aren't playing out the way that we hoped that they would, and in the moments of uncertainty when we don't know what's gonna happen and we can't predict the next couple of weeks, let alone the next couple of months. God, thank you that we can run to you with our concerns, with our worries and our burdens. And God, I pray today for the person that's struggling through everything that's happening in their world financially. God, for those who are battling things medically that may not have anything to do with a pandemic and yet they're very fresh on their mind and very much in front of their face. And God, for those of us whose hearts are extraordinarily lonely, God, I pray that you would bring the hope of an ongoing relationship with you into each individual's lives who is struggling deeply with being alone and isolated right now. And God, at every turn, please remind us that there really is nothing better than you. And that as we go through our lives, we have the incredible opportunity to model the love that you share with us, with other people. So today I pray that you would teach us more about how to do that in a way that reflects you well. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a time when somebody asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Everybody knew that God had rules and things that were important to him, but this person wanted to know what was most important to God. And Jesus' response became immortalized. Here's what he said. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second, the co-greatest commandment, right up there with it, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You want to know what's most important to God? Well, love God and love your neighbor. And last week we saw that this term neighbor was bigger than just the people on your street. It was everyone in the ripple effect of your life. And Jesus says, you want to know what's right up on the top of God's list? Love thy neighbor. And we're spending two weeks talking about this command of Jesus because there probably hasn't been a time in our lives when we have needed this command more than we do now, right? And there's probably never been a time in the life of our church where we needed more clarity on how we're going to apply this command to our current culture than we do now. Like we, we need clarity about the common ground that we're going to stand on together and hold together as a church no matter what comes our way. And we don't just need clarity, like we need help. I, I need help. This command, love your neighbor, it's said so often and written so often, it almost feels cliche or, or, or kind of cute, you know, but goodness, I, the more I look in my own heart and the more I look out at the world, the less cute Jesus's command becomes. I think the more that we look out at our world, especially in recent months, no, the more profound it becomes, the more revolutionary it feels, the more rare it seems, and the more desperate for it we are. Is anybody desperate for some more love thy neighbor to be in our culture? Yeah, I know I am. And that's why in these weeks we are looking at two things that define the command, two things that are required by the command to love your neighbor. Two things that were we to embrace them would instantly begin to take this profound command of Jesus off the pages of our Bible and into our hearts and into our communities and into our homes and our schools and our culture and into our city. Two things that have the power to move us either individually or collectively in the direction of, uh, keep us in the place of, and maybe even enable us to lead others in the direction of love thy neighbor. Two things. One is about the way that we think. The second is about what we do. And we started last week talking about this way of thinking, and we listened to the apostle Peter call us to embrace the simple, world-changing truth that everyone is someone that God made and Jesus died for, and call us to carry that truth into every situation and every scenario that we are in, the price tag of the precious blood of Jesus. Well, this week, I'd like to move on to number two, and it is not a call to embrace a way of thinking. It's a call to commit to a course of action. And the context is crucial. The passage that we're going to look at today is found in the gospel account of the historian Luke. And in this instance, Jesus is talking to a crowd, and he, sure enough, as he's talking, the subject matter of what's important to God comes up. And as I'm sure he did many times everywhere that he went, Jesus affirms the greatest commandment, love God and love your neighbor. But this time in the audience was an expert in the Jewish law, and he decided that he was going to spar with Jesus. <laughs> Good luck, bro. And instead of letting Jesus off with such an easy answer, he asks him a question. And what we're about to read happens immediately after the greatest commandment has just been uttered. And this man asks Jesus a question, and what he's looking for is a loophole. Here's how Luke describes it. But he, the expert in the law, wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> and you can hear the challenge in the question, like, okay, that's cool and all, Jesus, like, love your neighbor. But what does that even mean? Like, who are we even talking about here? <laughs> this guy, you know. And in response to him, Jesus does what he normally does, and he makes everything uncomfortable. He takes his audience and indirectly takes us out of our comfort zone, and he applies the command to love your neighbor in the hardest possible context. He gives us the parable of the Good Samaritan. And that's the parable that I want to look at for a few minutes today, and I got to warn you, what happened to me might happen to you. You might be caught off guard by this parable once we dive into it. That's what happened to me. I mean, you hear the phrase Good Samaritan all the time, but I'm telling you the story that Jesus actually tells around it is so rich and so real that when I actually studied it and when I actually dove into it, it hit me hard. Like it, it rocked my world. 
So y'all, this sermon is, is fresh. This is what God is teaching me real time right now. And I'm honored to talk about it and be learning it in community with you. So we're gonna listen to Jesus illustrate for us in creative and dramatic fashion what it means to love your neighbor. And remember, this isn't about thinking and feeling. This is about doing. Jesus is about to give us, I believe, a to-do list for loving your neighbor. And what I want to suggest to you today and what I believe God's convicted me of is that without his list, we can't fulfill his command. I mean, we can think the way Jesus wants us to think all day long, but unless we also do what he's asking us to do, we're going to miss it. It's why he positioned the parable of the Good Samaritan next to and an explanation of his command to love your neighbor. And here's the list. I'll go ahead and give it to you. As a person and a church that wants to move in the direction of and set up camp on the ground of loving your neighbor, there's a need to notice, there's a barrier to break through, and there's a price to pay. If we're going to be the kind of people and the kind of church that loves our neighbor as Jesus intends us to, there's a need that we're going to have to be in the habit of noticing. There's a barrier that we're going to have to find the courage to break through. And most importantly, there is a price that we're going to have to be willing to pay. Let's start with the need to notice. And this is where Jesus launches into his parable and starts to get really descriptive. Here's what he says. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he fell into the hands of robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead on the side of the road. So just to be clear, a Jewish man has been robbed, beaten, and left on the side of the road, naked, bleeding, unconscious, and unable to move, and probably dead by nightfall. Jesus brings our attention to a neighbor in need. And the applied question is, do you see it? Do you notice the need? Because that's what is required by, that's what this commandment means, this thing that is most important to God. Loving your neighbor means noticing their need. It means noticing the family down the street that's going through financial hardships. It means noticing the coworker who lets slip that their family member is sick. It means noticing that friend of your kid whose parents are getting divorced. It means noticing kids in our school systems that are facing food scarcity. It means noticing the homeless people that are on the side of the road with that sign day after day after day. It means noticing anyone who is in need or in danger or at risk or being taken advantage of. It means noticing anyone who has been exposed in any way to harm or injustice or degradation. Church, have you noticed a neighbor in need in this season of pandemic? Have you noticed a neighbor in need in this season of racial tragedy? Jesus is saying loving your neighbor means noticing their need. And I believe he paints this picture because it's not a given that we're going to notice not at least in any way that leads to action. It's not a given that we're going to notice. Not in our day and evidently not in theirs either because that's the story that Jesus tells. That's the narrative that he plays out. Remember, all of this is on purpose, carefully constructed by Jesus for us to watch. He continues in the story, a priest happened to be going down the same road. Oh, thank God. And when he saw him, when he saw the man, he passed on by the other side. A priest, if you're not sure what that is. In our day, it's kind of like a pastor. But in their day, this was the man who made sacrifices for the sins of the Jewish people. He was someone who mediated their relationship to God at the temple. He was a shepherd. He was a guide. He was a teacher. He was a good man. And here he comes upon his dying countrymen. And somehow he walks on by. Perhaps it was because he had urgent business, you know, for God at the temple, perhaps it was because he thought the man was already dead, and in their law, if you touched a dead person, you would be ceremonially unclean for a substantial amount of time and unable to serve in the temple. Perhaps it was because he figured somebody else will come along in just any minute, and they're more qualified. We don't know, but he walked on by. He saw the situation, but he turned a blind eye. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, 
A Levite also worked in the religious system of Judaism. I think more like a church staffer or a, a volunteer captain. And he comes upon this man, and for reasons that we can only guess at, he too walks on by. He sees the situation, but he turns a blind eye. And I think Jesus wanted us to be bothered by this. Not so that we could criticize these two and be like, oh, they're bad people. No, those were normal people. I mean, one of them was a, a priest. These were good men. And that's what should bother us. That they're no different from us. That we're susceptible to the exact same mistakes that they were. Good people will always be able to find good reasons to walk on by. Good people will always be able to find good reasons to just keep walking, reasons that make sense, reasons that if people hear them, they go, oh yeah, man, I mean, that's really unfortunate, but you did the right thing. I mean, after all, you had church. And by the way, I love that Jesus made their profession the temple. Clearly, he cares more about us getting this right than he does about us going to church. Let that sink in for a second. So number one, there's a need to notice. Let's move on to number two, because it's here that the hero of the story comes in. The one who notices. The one who actually stops walking. And, and, and the character that Jesus chooses to use for the hero, of course, is incredibly controversial. In fact, if you and I had been in the audience that day, chances are you and I would have gotten mad at Jesus. Chances are we would have argued with Jesus when he was done. Chances are some of us would have tweeted something snarky or posted some stats and added Jesus while he was talking. Because Jesus wasn't trying to make his audience feel comfortable. No, he was trying to make his audience feel uncomfortable. He was trying to pull his audience out of their comfort zone, beyond their current standard, beyond their current version of love your neighbor that they had so carefully constructed. And so Jesus brings in a Samaritan. It goes on like this. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And his Jewish audience groans. They're like, oh, you know, their eyes start rolling, frustrations start rising, arguments are already being formed. Why? Well, because Jews and Samaritans were not friendly neighbors. Their bad relationship had actually been going on for centuries. I mean, this was centuries old. It went all the way back to the time when Israel split between a northern and a southern kingdom. In the ninth century, King Omri made Samaria the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, in opposition to Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah, a national divide, a national conflict. National divide also became spiritual divide when they erected a temple in Samaria to Baal, and it became a center of idolatry in defiance of the temple in Jerusalem and the priesthood in Jerusalem. Then national and spiritual division uh, became racial division. Because Assyria invaded the northern kingdom and the Jews living in Samaria, the Samaritans, they intermarried with their captors and their pure Jewish blood became tainted with foreigners. So, so I don't want you to miss this mess that Jesus has created in this story. I mean, it's centuries of resentment, centuries of conflict, and centuries of racial prejudice. I mean, man, if only Jesus could tell a story that was relevant to our times. <laughs> I mean, can you believe it? That's the context of the good Samaritan. Jesus' illustration of what it means to love your neighbor is one filled with national, spiritual, and racial division. Why? Because he wanted us to understand a second profound and powerful point. There's not just a need to notice, there is a barrier to break through. I mean, think about all the barriers that the Samaritan had to break through to help his Jewish neighbor. I mean, he had to break through the barrier of comfort. He was on his way and had to stop. This guy is bleeding and sweating and dirty and ew, you know? He had to break through social norms. Did I mention that he was naked and unconscious on the road? If you're lying down naked and unconscious, I ain't picking you up. I'm getting blankets or something at least. Uh, he had to break through barriers of patriotism, like, oh, we are enemies. You're everything wrong with this country. He had to break through barriers of religion. We believe two different things. Uh, you're crazy. He had to break through barriers of status. All you Jews think you're so much better than us, and he had to break through barriers of racial prejudice. 
and all of the animosity and the suspicion and the stereotypes. I mean, each of these men had centuries of stories and talking points and narratives and grudges between them. The barriers between these two men were monumental and catastrophic. And yet, the Samaritan breaks through. Here's what Jesus says, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Three men walk by. Only one loves his neighbor. Why? Because he noticed the need, and he broke through the barrier. Question. What barriers have traditionally kept you from loving some of your neighbors? Have you seen one along the way in the story that looks a little familiar? I know I have. And if you do, don't feel judged, don't feel attacked, don't, don't feel guilty. We all have them. I mean, remember, the priest of Judaism felt them, and he was a good man. But that, remember, after all, that was Jesus' point. He's doing all of this exactly like he wants to. He is telling us this story because he intends for us to to identify and call out the barriers in our lives that are keeping us from loving some of our neighbors. So what are they? Maybe we should name them. Because until we know what they are, we can't break through them. And, and I would just suggest from personal experience, maybe even personal confession, that the greatest barrier to loving your neighbor is usually our baggage, not our bank account. It's usually our, our baggage, not our bank account. I mean, we usually have or can collectively find the resources to help our neighbor. That's usually not the greatest challenge. No, the greatest challenge is usually breaking through all of the other stuff. You know, like the discomfort or the inconvenience or the pain of sacrifice or the complexity of a problem or the messiness of a situation or, or the history of all the conflicts and slights and mistakes and wrongs that led to the thing in the first place or the extreme differences of opinion or appearance or the political and social narratives that have been built and built and built and built and sometimes hyped up by the media. Those things are usually the more challenging ones. We all have barriers. But if you're gonna love your neighbor, as Jesus is commanding, it's going to require a breakthrough. So one, there's a need to notice. Two, there's a barrier to breakthrough. And then finally, and most importantly, and most powerfully, there's a price to pay. And that's exactly what the Samaritan does. Here's how the story continues. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, Next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. He noticed the need, he broke through the barrier, and then he paid the price for his neighbor's healing. He not only did he come out of pocket with his own medical supplies, he put him on his own mode of transportation, and he took him to the nearest hotel, opened up a tab, and said to the innkeeper, whatever you got to do to take care of this man, put it on me. And you guys, that's the final thing that we're called to do, the final thing that loving your neighbor means. It means paying the price. It means paying the price. Each one of us is called to pay the price for our neighbor's healing. And I imagine that at this point, Jesus' audience is silent, convicted, cut to the heart. I imagine they're standing there like you and me are contemplating their own lives and their own neighbors. And Jesus simply asks this question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, the one who noticed the need, who broke through the barriers and who paid the price. And then Jesus ends with these four powerful words. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Go and do 
Likewise, you want to know what's going to get the command to love your neighbor off the pages of our Bible and into our hearts and into our streets and into our schools and into our homes and into our culture and into our cities? Going and doing likewise, committing to a course of action, resolving to be a good Samaritan, resolving to be a people who notice the need and break through the barrier and pay the price for our neighbor's healing. Man, I I don't know about you, but that's just so powerful. I mean, I I don't care who you are. Isn't that so inspiring? Like whether you're a Christian or not, or a church person or not, like don't you want this to happen in your community? I sure do. Listen, church, for us, this isn't just a hypothetical. This is who we are. Jesus followers, this isn't just some ideal that we read in the Bible. This is who we're supposed to be. This is how people are supposed to experience us in times like these. A good Samaritan isn't a term that Jesus coined to describe heroes. It's a term he coined to describe Christians. It's us. It's who we are. We're the people who pay the price, whether that's a dollar amount or whether it's simply the cost of our time or the cost of our presence or the cost of our voice or the cost of our assistance or our listening ear or our open arms. We're the people who notice the need, who break through the barriers and who pay the price for our neighbor's healing. It's who we are, or at least it's who we're supposed to be. Like when that family on your street is going through a real struggle and everyone's walking by. We stop and pay the price. What do you need? What can we do? When that coworker lets slip that a family member has gotten really sick and everyone's just walking by, we stop and pay the price. What do you need? What can I do? When a father of one of your kid's teammates gets that terrible diagnosis and everyone's just walking by because, yeah, we're all busy and life just tempts us to do that, we don't. We stop and pay the price. What do you need? What can I do? When kids in our local schools are facing food scarcity and too many people are walking by, we don't. We stop and pay the price like, hey, let's get food together. Who's already stopped that we can come around and support? When single moms are struggling and too many people are walking by, we don't. We stop and pay the price. When kids don't have safe homes to live in or functional homes to be in and everyone or too many people are just walking right by, we don't. We're the people who stop and pay the price. When a pandemic comes and hospitals need meals and the Red Cross needs blood and ICUs need medical supplies and everyone feels almost too scared and too stressed to do anything but walk on by, we don't. We stop and we pay the price for our neighbor's healing. When racism shows its ugly face, we are not the people who walk on by. We're the people who stop and join the effort to pay the price for our neighbor's healing. We stand against it. We take criticism if we have to. We get uncomfortable if we have to, but we don't turn a blind eye. No, we pull out our wallet and say, when it comes to my orbit, you can put it on me. When, whenever we find any pockets of prejudice or patterns of injustice, we're not the people that walk on by simply because it doesn't affect us. No, we're the people that break through the barrier. We're the people that get into the mess and join the effort to pay the price for our neighbor's healing. We educate ourselves if we need to. We speak up when we need to. We lean in locally to whatever work needs to be done. We don't wait on someone else. Are you kidding me? No, we're the church. We're the Jesus followers. This is our fight. This is our calling. We don't wait on someone else. No, we pull out our card and put it on the table and say, you're going to need to open up a tab. Or for that matter, when anyone, anywhere, of any time in the future, of any color, of any culture, of any character, is lying on the side of the road in need. As Jesus followers, we relish the opportunity to notice their need and break through the barriers and pay the price for their healing. It's who we are. It's who we're supposed to be. A good Samaritan isn't a term Jesus coined to describe heroes. It's a term he coined to describe Christians. It's who we are. And listen, this is really important. I'm not saying that there is a way that you need to be doing this. 
or that you need to be like me or that you need to be like her or him or them or any particular group. No, that's the beauty of a movement, isn't it? That's the beauty of this body that we call the church. Every single one of us can move in our own ways that are as diverse as the colors of our skin and the wirings of our minds and the makeups of our personality and our abilities. There are so many options for loving your neighbor like the Good Samaritan. The only thing that isn't an option is to walk on by because that's what it means to love your neighbor. Like if loving your neighbor were a car, the fuel in the engine is what we talked about last week. Everyone is someone. Everyone is someone. He is someone God made and Jesus died for. She is someone God made and Jesus died for. That's the fuel in the engine. But y'all, at some point, the rubber has to meet the road and the car's got to go somewhere. And Jesus is saying the tires on the car of love your neighbor are when we notice the need, break through the barrier, and pay the price. And man, I am so honored and so proud to be a part of a church that has sold out to that. You guys blow me away by how you do this year after year. You notice the need. You break through barriers. You pay the price for your neighbor's healing all over the city year after year. Oh, it's so amazing. And, and it's why I believe that we are poised to make such a difference in this season of pandemic and in this season of racial tragedy, in a season where division and isolation kind of seem to be on the rise. I think we have an unbelievable opportunity to stay committed to our mission, to stay committed to our calling as a church. I mean, imagine if the church were leading the way in this. I mean, honestly, we might need to catch up in some respects, but I'm dreaming about the day, and I know you're dreaming about the day, when the church is leading the pack and loving our neighbor. And so in the name of that, I'd love to give you three questions to consider today or talk about with somebody next to you. And they're simply these. Number one, what need do you need to notice? As everyone else is walking on by, what need do you need to notice? Or number two, what barrier do you need to break through? What barriers do we need to break through? Let's call them out and let's knock them down. And then finally, number three, what price is Jesus asking you to pay for someone else's healing? Man, I'm telling you, if you want to see the command to love your neighbor, get off the pages of our Bible and into our hearts and into our streets and into our cities and into our culture. If, if you want to see yourself or see us collectively move in the direction of and stay in the place of love your neighbor. Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Let's go be a good Samaritan. Ask God to help you notice the need, claim the power of the Holy Spirit to break through the barriers and then pay what you can towards the price of your neighbor's healing. That's who we are. That's who we are. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, open our eyes to notice the need. Give us the strength to break through the barriers. And oh God, break our hearts that we may help pay the price for our neighbor's healing. And oh Father, that is what we're asking for. That is what we are desperate for, for our city and for our country, healing. Give healing, bring healing in Jesus' name, amen. Notice the need, break through the barrier and pay the price. That's what it takes for us to truly love our neighbor, both individually and as a church to be loving the lake country here in Georgia's lake country. And so the opportunity is there. The, the thought is in our minds. So this week we get some time to think through what does that look like and how do I live that out in my everyday relationships? And I hope that you'll take time to do that and just contemplate what we've heard this morning. 
And even though we're not able yet to offer family ministry environments each Sunday, we do have fresh content put online every single Sunday for your family. So I hope that you'll explore that. There's new content that's there today for your preschoolers, your elementary kids. There's some coming soon for your middle and high school students today. And so you'll definitely want to jump into that. And you can find it at lakeaconeychurch.org slash family on demand, all one word. And that information is there available to you. And I hope that you'll take some time to go through that with your family during the course of this week, even as you continue to enjoy this holiday weekend. And we'll see you right back here next Sunday as we'll be both online and in the room uh, available to you. And I hope that you'll take advantage of that. So have a great week and we'll see you then. Take care.